Matthew's Gospel 28. <clears throat> we have been looking at the Spirit upon. The Spirit upon. Hallelujah. Matthew's Gospel 28. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority that's but power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So go to Mark 16. Mark 16, 15. And said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. This sign shall follow them that believe in my name. Verse 17, they shall cast out demons as well devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Verse 18, they shall take up serpents and do their death shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Verse 19, so then after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was written up in heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Verse 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them, them is italicized, and confirming the word with signs following, amen. Now, John's Gospel 20. John's Gospel 20. Verse 19. Then the same day at the evening, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst. And said unto them, Peace unto you, or peace be unto you. And he, and when he said so, uh, so, so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace unto you, or peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them, them is italicized, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. 23, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, he says, they are retained. So, we're looking at the Spirit upon. Now, in Luke's rendering of this account, which is uh, according to Luke's Gospel 1, verse 3 and 4, this happened within 40 days. In Luke's rendering, verse 2 and 3, pardon me. In Luke's rendering of that, Luke let us understand that Jesus was saying this from all the scriptures. Luke's Gospel 24, 25, and all fools and slow of heart, verse 25, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, not, not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Look at 27. And begin at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded the word very many, meaning to interpret, uh, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. All the scriptures. Look at 44. And he came unto them and spake unto them, saying, these are the words which I said to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. 45, then open ye their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now the word understand the scriptures there, we've seen the meaning, is the word suniemi, S-U-N-I-E-M-I, two words, son together, then the word nohima, N-O-E-M-A, which means to reason together. Which means that we must always read the scriptures together. Some say scriptures together. Say scriptures together. So I told you, what, I'm not sure whether you were, it was this service, but definitely it's this church, that when you say the Bible says, it's not a verse. Is that very clear? The moment you say the Bible says, you must begin, in, begin from where? Huh? Genesis to Malachi. The Bible says is. 39 books and 66 books together. The Bible says it's not one verse. The Bible says it's not two verses. The Bible says it's all the scriptures. So the, the, the practice of quoting might lead to error. That's why we take our time in this local assembly to ensure that we deliberately deliberate in scriptures and handle it delicately. That's some rhyme. Deliberately, deliberate, delicately. They said, oh, come on. Am I hungry? I said, delicate. Delicacy. Delicate. 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 Whatever. So we are deliberate about this. 
And so which means that the moment he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, that word was studied from when to where? Genesis to Malachi. When it says, make disciples of every nation, Genesis to Malachi. So, in Luke 24, 47, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached. Repentance and forgiveness of sins according to the scriptures. Matthew 28, 20, teaching them according to the scriptures. So we must therefore learn to read the scriptures together. And I'll tell them this is the first service, how that some words may have a different meaning in today's language. Thank you. Hallelujah. You know, this practice of removing suit, I also learned it. One time like that, I went to a country that was very cold. I didn't know. So I was used to taking off my suits. So I took off the suit, and then I began to shake on the pulpit. So I was looking at how to get my suit back. So I said, go to Luke 24, 49. It says, tarry in the city of Jesus, you will be endued. I said, the word endued, it means to wear something. Now give me a lesson, let me just show you. <laughs> I'm not joking, though. So I wore the suit back, and I said, wow. I said, so with this now, you are endured. Let's go to the next verse. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, where were we? So you have, that means you must follow the Bible pattern of use of words. So interpreting scriptures, there are words I call codified language. Now many of you who are into practices or, um, for example, if you're a lawyer and they use a word, a phrase, okay, and we say, what is the obita? Or is it Latin word actually? An obita dictum. And then you say, what is the ratio decidendi? Or the ratio, the meaning, the reason for the decision. Now, that is a single word, but you may read sometimes 100 pages. Just one word. For example, if the guy says, well, it was not uh, uh, just words like that that are used to that practice. So they are codified languages. That by the time you refer to one word, it may re I may have to refer to many books. So when you see words like that in interpreting scripture, I also developed a concept we call, or we did a concept called the codified language. Now, what is a codified language? It means it is structured, it is narrated, and it is in a chronology, structured. Then it has a story. Then the chronology, that is, you are looking at the time. Now, in the first service, I showed them the word right hand. And uh, I showed them where it began. It, it's first a story. Then that's a, a first a story. Then it now is used to express an event. Then it is now explained in the epistles. So you see the structure. The first story, what is the story? Then when it was used later on, you have to go back to that story. So when you come to now, and you want to refer to that same word, you go back to where it was used after, and then the original story. So by the time you see the word in the epistles, it carries more than just a dictionary meaning. For example, if I, um, for, I was using this example in a class during the week, I think. I said, if I say, let's move this house, or, or, or say, well, what's happening next? I'm moving house. Now, when I say I'm moving house, and then the guy puts, depending on who it is, the old house in a truck. Some it could be a bag. But the whole house is in a truck. You know, they say, ah, I'm moving the house. But that house could probably also have your television sets. You could have your, uh, I almost said transistor radio. That's quite, quite Old Testament. They you say, your shoes, your um, clothes. So, one single truck has many things inside that you must make a distinction. So, sometimes a word in the Bible is like that truck. You have to look into it to understand the meaning. That's why we said codified language will be structured, narrated, and then has a chronology, a pattern. So in every Bible interpretation of words of the epistles, you must go to the original language, for example, the grammar and the context. That's even by the way. 
So in Luke 24, something was said. Luke 24, verse 21. When Jesus was asking those two folks, Cleopas and likely his wife, and he says, why are you guys arguing? And then they went on and on and they said in 21, we trusted that, let's take it together, Luke 24, 21, let's go. But we trusted that it had been he that should have redeemed Israel. That should have redeemed Israel. We trusted. Take that statement together. In the Greek, it goes like this. El piso men, otos enstein o melon lustetrat Israel. I put it together for a purpose. Which means that the entire hope of scripture is that statement. We trusted. Help his own Help his own men, autos, estan, o melon, lutristia, Israel. It's in itself the meaning of 39 books of scripture. That singular statement. So by saying, redeem Israel. Interestingly, and I submit to you that they were referring to Exodus chapter 6. And verse 6. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6 where you will find the story. The story, Exodus 6, verse 6, the word redeemed. Of course, now when you say redeemed, you look at the church. Because uh, I'm not redeemed though. <laughs> what are you? I'm a saint. <laughs> you need hands to be laid on you. Exodus 6, 6. Therefore says, say unto the of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from one of the bodies of the Egyptians. I will rid you of their bondage. I will redeem you. I will redeem you. The word there is gal. G-double-A-L. I will redeem you. G-double-A-L. Now look at Exodus 15, 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed, thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Now, of course, if you look at the story here, the story was that they were in Egypt under the bondage of the Egyptians, and God rescued them, right, and took them out of the land. Okay, if that's the story, then why would the disciples of Jesus say that they thought Jesus was going to take them out of the same land that their fathers went to. So you find in the Exodus story, they are taken out of Egypt to a land. But in this story, they are not leaving the land. And it's the same word, redeemed. Gal in Hebrew, lu. Tron, as we're going to see it in the Greek, but it's together that lustrostra, because uh, I, I'll probably spell that later on. Now, the moment I see it in Exodus, it must be found where? Genesis. Okay, let's see Leviticus 25 again. Leviticus 25, All right, verse 25. Watch how it's used now. <laughs> if your brother be waxing poor and has sold away some of his possession, if any of his kin come to redeem, relative there, 26. If the man had none to redeem it and himself be able to redeem it, 30, verse 30. If it's not redeemed, that means to claim back property. And also 33, so it's to claim back property that belongs to another one as a king's man. Gal, G W A L. So we said this has to be found again in Genesis. So let's say the first use of that word. So the first thing, now look at this. We read in the day of Jesus, these guys were hoping Jesus was going to redeem them. Now redeem them from what? They're not in Egypt. Because redeemed is Egypt to Canaan. They are already in Jerusalem, so why? need a redeemed action or redemption. Yet again, when we read Exodus, we go again to the first time it's used. Genesis 48. 
I need your attention here. If you're a student, listen well. Genesis 48. This is Jacob. Genesis 48. Verse 15. He blessed Joseph and said, God, now listen carefully here. God, before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, did walk, the God, which fed me all my life long unto this day. God, then he says, the God. Now, look at the next statement. The angel that redeemed me from all evil. Let's start again. The God before whom my fathers did walk. The God, or God, sorry, the second word, the God which fed me. The word fed there is the word for pastor. Shepherd. Ra. R-double-A-H. That phrase, again, I told you agrarian in culture, not agrarian, like I said some time ago, bad pronunciation. Agrarian, Genesis 4, verse 2, keeper of sheep. Abel, keeper of sheep. Genesis 29, verse 79. 29, verse 79. Did I see that? Genesis 29, verse 7 and 9. Sorry for that. <laughs> Water the sheep and feed them. Verse 9. Came with thy father's sheep and she kept to keep the sheep. That's the word fed. To keep the sheep. Genesis 30 and 31. So far, it's used for animals. Genesis 30, 31. I will again feed and keep thy flock. Then 36. Feed the rest of Laban's flock. Then, I think I skipped one. 30. So, you see, consistently, it's used for keeping sheep. Then when you read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Same word. The Lord is my shepherd. Ezekiel 34 verse 14, God is introduced. Ezekiel 34 verse 14. I will feed them in a good pasture. That's God speaking himself in verse 12 as a shepherd. So, listen carefully now. This is vital. The God... Okay, God, the God of my fathers. We're back in Genesis 48, 16. That's the text we're on. 15, sorry. The God before whom my fathers. I've made a mistake. Let me say it again. He said, God before whom my fathers. God, one. The God, the shepherd. Is that very clear? Is that clear? God, the shepherd. Okay. God, the shepherd. There's one more I'm trying to see. It's one minute. Okay, Isaiah 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Then Hosea. Hosea 4, that should be verse 16 too. For Israel slides back as a backsliding eye. For now the Lord will feed him as a lamb in a large place. So, this is Jacob. Watch how he describes God. God, the God, the shepherd. Then verse 16, the angel, messenger. So we have God. God, the shepherd. God, the messenger. God, the God, the messenger, the shepherd. So God is seen as a messenger of his own word, of his own self. God the shepherd, God of my fathers. 
He says, now look at this. If you had used, if you are talking about three persons, he will say, bless the lads. He uses the word singular for many people, which means that he's describing God in three personalities. God, God the shepherd, God the servant. He says, he has redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads. He has redeemed me from evil. He has rescued me. He said he's the God of my fathers. Familiar term. So which means that from here, we have seen the word gal refer to one, a relative. Two, one who rescues. Yep. Is sent. Malak, angel there simply, is not angelic being. Is the word malak in Hebrew, M-A-L-A-K. It means saint. And you see that Jesus carried this out, right? Did he? Come on. Come on now. So Jesus carried that out as well, as a servant, or the messenger, and also as shepherd. Is that clear? Very good. So he says, he blessed me. The word blessed means to accept, to welcome, so now, in 16, he says, he has redeemed me. So the very root of redemption is, one, to keep. Two, there's worship in it. Then three, to rescue from. To rescue from. So, Redeemed also means family. Family. So, why did God go to Egypt? Because he had become family with Abraham. Is that clear? So, he goes to keep them to gather together. Right? And he goes to rescue them. So, redeemed... Means we are family. Is that clear? Are you following? It also means what? We are rescued. And we are also gathered together. That's the structured way to look at that phrase. So, now, did that play a part in the Exodus? Can we say play the part? I didn't hear you. Come on. He goes there like family. Okay. He calls them his people, his son, his firstborn. Exodus 4.22. Then he rescues them from the hand of Pharaoh to himself for worship and together as a nation. Then he keeps them. That's the word gal. So in the New Testament, and I want you to observe this, because as they cross into the Greek words, they split it up. Now, in splitting it up there, we must maintain the Old Testament usage. In Luke 24, 21, for example, when it says redeemed there, it's the word lutron. L-U-T-R-O. Let me give you a background again. Every word must be found where? Old Testament, right? Very good. So, the Old Testament meaning is to rescue as family to keep. To rescue as family to keep. To rescue as family to keep. Now, there's a shade of it that we're about to see in a moment. So, the word Lutron, Paul applies that word in Titus 2.14. Titus 2.14. Titus 2.14. I want us to read it together. Titus 2.14. Let's start from 13. Looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He is the great God, he is our Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 14, let's go. Who shall who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous for good works? Does he capture it? Does he capture it? Come on, does he capture it? Very good. So one. First Peter 1.18. 
For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Then he says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, so you are redeemed with the blood of Christ. When you say the blood of Christ, that refers to his sacrifice and resurrection. We're coming to that in a moment. And without sport. Okay. Now, so here, the word lutron, L-U-T-R-O-O, is a verb, just like Luke 24, 21. Now, we have another one. Apolutrosis. A-P-O-L-U-T-R-O-S-I-S. A-P-O-L-U-T-R-O-S-I-S. Look at Luke 21, 28. Luke 21, 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, verse 27, you shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with glory and power. That's the resurrection of Jesus. And when you see these things come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption. Apollotrosis is near. Your redemption is near. Romans 3.24 Romans 3.24 And being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, Apollotrosis, that is in Christ. Now, you are about to see something. Romans 8.23, or we are about to see it together. Romans 8.23 Now, we have referred to things that have happened, right, in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24, talking about his blood. Luke 21.28, that one is a bit suspect, so let's find out. Now, look at this, Romans 8.23. Paul says, in 22, we know that the old creature groaneth and travails in pain together until now. But not only they, but also ourselves, which have the first fruit of the Spirit. First fruit simply means the first for other things to come. Even we ourselves, let's read it together, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. What is this now? The redemption of our bodies. All right? Adoption means to place as a son. That's Exodus. Exodus 4.22, to place as a son. Then it says redemption. We're already saved. It says of our physical bodies. Which means our physical bodies will be preserved. Gathered together. Preserved and rescued. Hmm. So it means the word redemption is a finished work, and what else? A future work. Is it making sense? So the finished work is the first fruits, right? Come on. Is that clear? Okay, good. So, Ephesians 1, 7. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 14, the same word redemption. Earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So there's redemption that has happened, right? And I will happen. And the, the usage of that word Gal comes to play as family. So which means that our physical bodies are incorporated in the work of salvation. So God will claim our bodies as his own. Is that very clear? Come on, let me see how they are following this. Are you following this? As his own. So my body is part of the plan. Is it? Is my body part of the plan? Come on. All right, Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God 
whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. So the indwelling of the Spirit is God's, listen now, is God's signature of ownership. A signature of ownership. Colossians 1.14, forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.15, it says, we, Hebrews 9.15, is the mediator of the New Testament by the means of death for the redemption of the transgressions. So sins, redeemed. Hebrews 9.15, Hebrews 11.35. That word deliverance there. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. So the word deliverance also means redemption. Here. So we have apolotrosis, which is the noun. Then one more. We have the word lutron. L-U-T-R-O-N. It means what was given. What was given. Matthew 20, verse 28. And Mark 10, 45. Jesus gave himself. Now, that makes sense because we said God, the shepherd, the messenger. Can you remember that? Who's following this? God, he's God. He's the shepherd. He's also the one that was sent to do it, right? So Jesus is also the redemption. Lutron. He gave himself. Now, there's another word used for this act of redemption. And many times it's the one that many people, myself including for years, were used to. So when you say redemption, you say the price that was paid for my salvation. So it's like God is angry with you. You sinned against God and he's angry. So just like you sinned against the government and you uh, maybe you, 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 you disobey the traffic lights. And then you say come and they drive you to one place. You know they are, they are also multidimensional. And they say, pay. So you pay to the government because you sinned against the government. So that is in your head. When you talk about Jesus, he paid the debt I do not hold. Who did you hold? Jesus. How does that sound? He paid the debt that, he, that, he, that, that I hold. Sorry. He paid the debt that I did not hold. I can't. We could never repay you, but from my heart. It's a good song. Go. I want to say that I thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for the grace that you. We could never repay. So I was hoeing God. Every time I opened my account, every morning, minus, 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 debit a lot, debit a lot, debit a lot, debit a lot. Ha! Then, he get, then at some point, the phone almost collapsed. David alert every 30 seconds. Then God says, I'll pay it. Then he writes the check, $1 million. Then he gives it to himself. I will say he's kind. <laughs> he paid himself. He said, you know, I know you can't do it. But let me pay myself. So that idea was because we didn't study the word very well. Go to Leviticus 19. Now we have another word, kofa. K-O-P-H-E-R. Kofa. It's equally in the Hebrew. Leviticus 19, verse 20. It says, Whosoever lies currently with a woman and is a bondmaid, betrothed to her husband, 
and not at all redeemed, nor freedom given her, she shall be scourged. So that means there will be a price. She's supposed to die according to their laws, but you can ransom her and put money to the penalty. So you put money on it. She ought to die, but we won't let her die. But in the place of her death, you will pay money. Or you pay something. That's what is called ransom. That's a bad word today. One has to be careful. I'm preaching the gospel. Ransom in today's world in Nigeria now. It's not something that should be in an illustration. But we have no choice. Now, it's, the, it's where we have the word ransom. You know? There you see Isaiah 45 verse 13. No, no, no. Don't go to Isaiah yet. The word kofa here, Leviticus 19.20. Then look at verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear thy grudge against the other people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the reason why he, he, he mitigated the penalty for death is because he wants them to love, to value people's lives. Okay, just wanted to add that critically. So you have that word, kofa. In Genesis, sorry, Exodus 21, verse 30. Exodus 21, verse 30. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatever is laid upon him. So money was now used as a replacement of the punishment. Kofar. Proverbs 13, verse 8. So it was to, to look at the value. Proverbs 13, verse 8. So when Jesus said, what shall a man give in the exchange of his life? Not even the whole world. So Jesus annulled that thinking that they were paying money for lives. That rather it was only an illustration to put value on human lives. Who's following what I say here? Okay, good. So look at Proverbs 13, verse 8. The ransom of a man's life are his riches, and the poor, poor has no rebuke. So the word kofa. The second word, which is a verb, is the word pada, P-A-D-A-H. It's a verb. We read it earlier. Which refers to an actual rescue. Exodus 21, verse 30. He shall give for the ransom of his life, whatever is laid on him. Exodus 21, 30. Psalm 49, verse 8. I think I have Numbers 3, 49. Numbers 3 and 49. Moses took the redemption money of them that were over and above them and were redeemed by the Levite. Redemption money. The value of the act of redemption. When you have value. Then one more. The word mekar. M-E-C-H-I-R. Cost. Isaiah 45 verse 13. So the concept of paying money was introduced as an illustration. The concept of using money to explain redemption is an illustration. So let's see. Illustration of value. Not an illustration of debt. D-E-B-T. No. Illustration of value. Isaiah 45 verse 13. I want us to read it together. Come on. I've raised him up in righteousness. I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city. He shall let go my captives. Not for price or reward, says the Lord. Not for price. Not for money. So now, watch what is going on here. God's act of redemption is done by himself. Against evil, right? Come on. Is to purchase for himself, not from himself, but for himself. So along the line, Moses, a writer of scripture, Moses precisely, 
now began to use money's worth as an illustration of what? Value and cost. But there's no man's life that is valued with money. It's to show the cost of the work. So in the use of redemption, what are the things that it carries? It carries the act of God. It carries the promise that he made. It carries his desire to be family. What else does he carry? Does he also carry value and cost? Now listen carefully. Is it that God is paying anybody anything? No. The act of it is value. What he has done is to show us, or the, what Moses is doing is to show us value. God, therefore, in redemption, shows us value. So when we say, the price that was paid for our sins, let's be very smart in that use of that word. It's not that we're owing God and paid back. Mm -mm. It is what he has done that has value. Let me see if you understand it. And the value, he equates with us. So, in the Old Testament, it is said that money cannot value a man's life. Is that very clear? Jesus said it. So, what God did is the value of our lives. Who's following this? Come on. So, if I value now today, if you say you want to value someone now, the value with Forbes. Ah, that guy is uh, rich. There was one guy like that. I said, I'm now a millionaire. I'm now a millionaire. I said, how much do you have? You just uh, maybe, maybe got five million or something. I said, you know, this is change in Yoruba. Share. Change it into dollars. By the time we arrived at the dollar, I said, that's barely... Um, no, we made three million, sorry, not five. I said, that's barely first class ticket. Your entire what <laughs> is in the air. <laughs> so he said, ah, I'm valued at this. And why do you say it? Because what they have in their accounts, what they have in assets, what they have in properties, and all that. So the Bible is saying, our value is what? Mm -mm. Our value is who? Because it is both the redeemer and the redemption. Who's following this? Come on. So, redemption used for the work of the cross is to show value on us, not a debt that was paid. Who's following this? Is this clear to you? Come on, guys. Is this clear to you? So, Christ did not die to satisfy a debt that we're owing God. No. Christ died to release us from sin and the devil and the value of that work is God himself. And that value he placed on us. Can, you, can I see you if you understand that? Is that very clear? So when we say redemption, redemption refers to Christ's work and the value of it. So redemption is a word that is codified. We must therefore see like just like a word like righteousness. You know, you can have a view of righteousness like, okay, I was uh, a sinner, now I'm justified. Glory to God. I am the righteousness of God. Some will say, and some people will say, righteousness is not what you do. It's again, righteousness is another codified language. Let me show you something. In Genesis. 15, where you first find the word righteousness, it was used for Melchizedek. Genesis 14, pardon me. Genesis 14. I'm looking for my Genesis 14 because my Bible is now codified. Look, I've seen it. Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem. The word Melchizedek simply means king of righteousness. He's a king of righteousness. And what did he say to Abraham? He says, possessor of heaven and earth. Kwana in the Hebrew means to acquire. 
So righteousness is first used here for God repossessing the earth. For God claiming back. And by the time you read the next chapter, you read about Abraham who believed in God. What did he believe? God said to him, pay attention, that in verse 5, Genesis 15, that all the stars cannot be up to the seed, your seed in all the earth. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and this was put in his account as God's righteousness. So righteousness is primarily what God has done. What God has done, which is right, is called righteousness. Now, look at Genesis 18. Genesis 18, for the same Abraham. Genesis 18, verse 19. I know Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and he shall keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness. That's what justice and judgment. So it's also found in Abraham's work. So righteousness is what God will do. Uh huh. Come on. Is that it? That becomes a gift to us. That is also what we do because of God's gift. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Where well, Genesis 15, 14, 15, 18. So it's one of those words that is that codified. You have to read the first history. Where did it come from? Then where was it used? And what was it used for? So the word diakosune, which is the Greek word for righteousness, is used the same way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6.33. And his righteousness. God's righteousness is now to us a gift. Then it now reflects in what we do. Righteousness, therefore, is God putting things together, putting things right, restoring things, reprocessing things, God doing right, or putting things right. Originally, I have time to just mention this, it was used for judges. When a judge says, no, you've got to go to jail. No, you should receive a compensation. That is righteousness. He's putting things right. So God is the one putting things right, by saving us to himself from sin, then we begin to do what is right, all in his righteousness. So righteousness is a gift, yeah? Is it also a conduct? Is it an activity? Come on, let me see how if you're following this. So those are codified words. I used to call them a big word. That is, they have, they don't have multiple meanings, no. They only have, listen to how I define coded language. Number one, it is structured. It has chronology, a time to it. Look at the sequence of time. Then look at the narration. It's structured. Then you have the narration behind it and the time. So you must start from Melchizedek, then Abraham. Then God's gift to Abraham in verse 6 of Genesis 15. Then Genesis 18, what Abraham would do with his children. And that's the same way it's done in the epistles. Firstly is what God has given us. Then secondly is what we're doing. And what God is doing in all the earth. That is the word righteousness. So I say, I have the gift of righteousness. And also our ministry is called the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21. So it's those kind of words. Romans 1.16. Look at this. Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes. Follow this. Firstly, to the Jew, Romans 1, 16 and 17, and then to the Gentiles or Greeks. For therein, look at this, 17, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So the righteousness of God is seen there as God bringing Jew and Gentile together. Righteousness of God. Look at Romans 3, Twenty-eight. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Look at the next statement, twenty-nine. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is not also of the Gentiles? Yea, of the Gentiles also. So, righteousness and justification equally refers to God. One relating with us, then also how He unites different nations. 
So I put it like this. First of all, righteousness is how God relates with me. Then how he brings me in union with others. So it's one of those words. It's codified. You must go to the narration, the chronology, and the history. Romans 5.17. That's why the death of Jesus is called righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Romans 5.17. Let me just mention this very quickly. In the entire epistles, the word righteousness is never used for individuals. Not once. When he mentions the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he refers to the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5.18 and 19 and 20. It's a ministry, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Reconciliation found in Jesus Christ. That ministry is righteousness in Christ Jesus. So when we see words, we must read them in the structure, in the we must bring the whole counsel of God's word into that word. The entire counsel of God's word. Just like we look at redemption. Redemption is what has happened and what is happening, right? And what will still happen. Righteousness is a gift. Righteousness is a conduct. It's also a ministry. Let me see if you're following this. So you will see it. Because Abraham will command his children and do just in the earth. That is ministry. God, what God did to Abraham when he believed, his righteousness. What Abraham did with what he received from God is also called righteousness or justice. And that's how to read Bible words. So, in looking at the word spirit upon, spirit upon, therefore, is Bible language. If I say spirit upon today, in today's language, I'll look at your head. Upon your head. Maybe forehead or middle of your head. But that is not Bible language. Look at John 20. Are you learning something? Right. In John 20, verse 18. I explained a bit of this in the first service. Look at the emphasis. John 21, the first day of the week. Come at Mary Magdalene. This is important. Listen well. First day of the week after the resurrection. The first person we are hearing, or we are seeing, pardon me, is a woman. Now, what did we call righteousness now? God putting things and also uniting Every distinction is broken down. Now, before now, within the patriarchal system of humanity, women were second class. Even among the patriarchs of the faith, they struggled with that culture. But in the resurrection, it is deliberate. The first person mentioned was a woman. Now, as though he wants you to emphasize it, in verse 19, the same day at the evening being the first day of the week. Then he says to them, peace unto you. Aaron, E-I-R-E-N, was shalom in the Greek, in the Hebrew, uh, Aaron in the Greek, E-I-R-E-N. Peace unto you. That means union with God. It means together, complete, whole. Wholeness of relationship with God. It is now for you. Then what does he do after? Listen carefully now. He says to them in 21, Peace unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Then he breathed on, emphasis. I believe we checked this last week, did we? Huh? Did we? Emphasis. He said, breathe on and said, receive ye the Spirit. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Lambano. L-A-M-B-A-N-O. Lambano means to take hold of, to lay hold of, to take from. Now, why did he use receive for them? Because he had already breathed in them. And the Holy Ghost was living in them. So he says, receive ye the Spirit. Take the Spirit now. Take of the Spirit. Then he says, whosoever sins, 
Wow. That's key. Whosoever sings you a meat, whosoever you return everything, whosoever, whosoever is God's righteousness. Is that it? Whosoever. And Jesus used that phrase, whosoever. That means Jew, Gentile, great, small, slave, free, whosoever. I'm about to go somewhere. Male, female. Today we still have people argue whether a woman can be a pastor or not be a pastor and all that. Can a woman preach and stuff like that. And you know, he goes on and on and on. Hallelujah. Isn't that the brainwash younger folks? There was a guy who attended one of our Fortress Camp meetings, 2002, I think. Young boy. And then he said, I was blessed, but I have a problem. It was in SS2 or 1. Why are women preaching? I said, was that all you saw? He said, no, 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 I was there, but why are women preaching? He said, number two, they are also wearing trousers. And that one is not a, that was a regular problem. You know, he's a young boy. He doesn't even know where it is in the Bible. He said, because the Bible says a woman cannot be a preacher. Where? He didn't know. He's in, in our church. Women lead courses. Wow, thank God your church didn't write the Bible. <laughs> you shall receive. Then look at that word Lambano. That word Lambano is now consistent. Luke 24, 49. Jesus said, tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued. Enduo in the Greek. Okay, I mentioned that earlier. <laughs> Enduo. To wear on yourself. A verb. Acts 1 8, you shall receive power. Lambano, you shall receive power. Which in Acts 1 4 and 5, he calls the promise of the Father the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Acts 8 15, Samaria had received the word of the Lord in 14. Peter and John came down that they might pray for them and they might receive the Holy Ghost. Acts 8 15. Acts 10. 45, upon the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for we heard them speak with tongue and magnify God. Can anybody forbid these ones from baptizing water? For they had received. Acts 10, 47. Consistently. Acts 19, 2. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Have you received? So that statement that Jesus made in John 20, 22 is not salvation. It's a statement for ministry. Or the statement of the spirit upon. That was quick. <laughs> the spirit upon. So when we say the spirit upon, what are we talking about? Last week, we said the spirit upon is Genesis. And in Genesis 1-2, the Spirit is upon all the waters. No, the Spirit upon has no distinction. The Spirit upon has no qualification. The Spirit, except work of salvation, definitely. The Spirit of God has no distinction. Genesis 1-2. Now, the challenge people oftentimes face will be, but why? Have you heard people ask you questions? They say, well, women cannot do this. And then they, they begin to argue and argue. In the beginning, they argue a lot and argue. And then they said, uh, you know, I know many of these arguments because I've been involved in many. Oh, man, abroad. They say, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. And oftentimes, when they want to criticize this, they go after certain women who have not really been too nice. They say, can you imagine that? And I know that when people are dishonest, they take a wrong example to explain something. That's mischievous. That's mischievous. That's very mischievous. You want to condemn 
a medical practice. You say, all medical practice is very evil. You say, why? There was one doctor. Ah. My God, we have millions of them. I don't care. The one I saw, he gave me injection on my nose. He's a quack. They're all quacks. No, you're being mischievous. That's one bad example. But we have a lot of good doctors, I believe. <laughs> you know, mischievous people. Some people say, oh, the pastors, they'll hear about, you know. I remember one time, me and my dad had this argument about ministry. We should fight a lot about ministry. So one day he came back. He said, I think you can be a pastor. I think it's a good thing. I was wondering why he said, he said ah, who knows you can buy your own jet. <laughs> so I told him, ah, ah. he said, ah, it's true. One road does not enter the market. <laughs> That's what he told me. This was about 20, 26 years ago. Or so. so the point is, you have people think like that. They say, oh, the pastors are just chopping money. And they say, oh, pastors are rich. And many times they will count 20. 20 out of thousands. Tens of thousands. You are being mischievous. Very mischievous. One person will say, this, this, this. how can a pastor have a jet? How can a pastor have a jet? Is your money missing? He said, no. But this is not the Christianity that we, our fathers gave us. I said, come close. When was the last time you went to preach to the unsaved? Mm -mm. He has never done it before. So you are disturbing the saved. This is not right. This is not good. How can the pastor have a jet? Okay, if he asks you to come inside, will you enter? <laughs> you are just being garrulous, cantankerous. What else can I use? <laughs> Stupid. Those are not sermons. That's not a sermon. Pastors now are having jets. If you give me, I'll take it. I've entered private jet before about two or three times. I liked it all. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so some people just criticize, say all these churches that you know, some say the problem of Nigeria, there are too many churches. Ah. Hey, churches are buying up all the warehouses. I don't understand. Were well, they not empty? <laughs> say, yeah, but but if the church wants it to salvation, you take that money and Give to business people. I don't understand. The people who were giving in the church, were they giving to start businesses for people? He said, no. Why did they give it? They're giving it to help the church. Eh? And give to their pastors. It's their choice. No! You start small scale business. You start one. How many have you ever helped? Mr. Critic. You, the people who come in front of your house and want to sell Ekpa. You say, what are you doing here? <laughs> you don't have anything, no? You are chasing people. Critics. Somebody was there. There was one lady like that. She was in the medical school. Almost final year. She was telling me, you see, pastor, people, ministers are living lavishly. She was, I looked at her. She said, I'm just, I said, my heart is grieving. Grieving. I said, okay. So I asked her a question. This house, who owns it? She said, my grandfather, he gave me. How many people live here? That's how many rooms? You know what I was going to? About four. How many live here? See, I stay alone. Okay. You alone. Okay. In that car, you go to school alone. Say, yeah, just drive to school. Yeah. You alone. Yeah. Pastors are living lavishly. <laughs> you alone in this house, a student, with a car. And pastors are living lavishly. Nonsense. So you find people they are still arguing whether women can be in the ministry. So say, well, they say, well, the Levitical priesthood, Levitical priesthood. Why didn't they choose women? Yes, women were not part of Aaron's priesthood. He said, even the disciples of Jesus. Why did you not choose woman? Eleven, uh, twelve men. Uh, eleven. Twelve disciples. 
You know, people can be very funny. But we say you must read everything together. I said, but Mary was a disciple. She sat. Luke 10, 38, 39. She sat at his feet. Amongst the disciples. That was a statement. In John 4, a woman before Philip had gone to Samaria to preach Christ. A woman. She went and the whole city. A woman. Uh, so, in John 20, it was categorical. Jesus appeared to the woman and said, go and tell my apostles. So she became the apostle to the apostles. Thank you. Because when he told them in Luke 24, all fools are slow of her to believe. On Mark 16, 14, when it says they were hard-hearted to believe, believe what? They did not believe the message of the woman. So today, when you see anyone who cannot hear a woman preach, is a fool and slow of heart. I'm quoting Jesus. <laughs> to believe. They go and tell them. Hey, you know, because they were subsumed in their culture, they said, it's I do tales. You know, women are emotional. Isn't it? Let me show you. Luke 24. That's what they called it. They said, you know, they said in verse 10, Luke 24, it was Mary Magdalene and Jonah. Jonah and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them. We told these things to the apostles. Women, not one single brother. They had no emoji. The first apostles of the resurrection of Jesus were women. Look at it. Look at the response. Look at verse 11. And their words seemed to them as what? I do things. Because in their culture, women's testimonies were not regarded well. So the resurrection is God's righteousness. Are you hearing this? That's God setting things right. There are things that God permitted because of human culture. The use of the, 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 the priesthood. That was human culture. The women could not be kings. That's human culture. But is it not the queen that chased Elijah? The man of God ran away. Leave that thing. But David the king said, no, God is the king. Hallelujah. And he says, see, he sat at the right hand of God. And we are now seated there, male and female. So put that aside. The entire priesthood is now in Christ and is male and female. That God permitted it because of human culture does not mean that was his word. Please follow what I'm saying here. So right there, even though he chose 12 men who were of all males in the mission of the gospel, he used women. In Luke 8, you found women also amongst them whom he called privately aside and was training them. At the cross, only women were there. All the 12 went to watch Chelsea. <laughs> you don't know it. I'll show you the original later. Imagine the first apostles, women. So when Joel got up in Joel 2 28, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all. That is Genesis 1 2, upon all flesh. Then he said, Your sons and daughters. That is God's righteousness. Are you there? He's putting things right. Then, in case you think he's just talking about sons and daughters like in your family, he says, Your male servants and your handmaids. That means there will be women ministers. Who's for what I'm saying here? Women ministers upon all flesh. That is God's righteousness. That is the Genesis language. So when anyone comes now and says, well, this is male and female, only males, not females, and they go to Leviticus, I'm going to answer them back like Jesus did in Matthew 19. In the beginning, it was not so. Hallelujah. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts. But at the beginning, it wasn't so. 
So what does Jesus bring? A new beginning. The first day of the week. Hallelujah. It was the woman who showed up. God is setting things right. God's spirit is upon women. Hallelujah. God's spirit is not gender friendly. It has, is, sorry, his, his gender is, how do I say, his gender blind. His age blind. Status blind. Culture blind. Tribe blind. Hallelujah. You follow what I'm saying here? You notice the people that Jesus was using? Prostitutes. One that was cast, that devils were cast out of her. But the Holy Ghost was on them. Hallelujah. Upon all flesh. Afterwards, said God. After what? what? After the Exodus. After redemption. I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. So what does Paul do? Paul's most important letter. Let me take that back. <laughs> His most scholarly letter was the book of Romans. Who did he give it to? A woman. Romans 16. 1. He said, I'm sending, I'm commending feed to you, a servant of the church at Crenshaw. Receive her and her ministry. Now, when they give letters, you don't just deliver and say, bye-bye. No. Anyone who carries a letter, not a tachycos, will be the one to explain the contents. So Paul gave a woman the revelation of the gospel. And everybody will sit down and the woman will explain it. That is God's righteousness. Hallelujah. First Timothy 2, quickly. You learning something? Are you learning something? First Timothy 2. Say, may the Spirit is upon all flesh. Say, the Spirit is upon all flesh, male and female. Hallelujah. Because right in Genesis, I told you the word image of God is what? A corporate status, an agency. Male and female made he them. That's God's agency, male and female. That's the beginning. That's the beginning. Hallelujah. That's the beginning. And if you notice, who was making the utterances about the Redeemer? Genesis 3.15, God said that to the woman. Genesis 4, it was the woman. Making the utterances about what God will do. The woman. First Timothy 2. You learning something? Hallelujah. For Timothy 2, verse 11. Oh, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Learn what? Learn what now? You mean if you are in class and you don't know anything? You say the woman cannot teach you. You will just fail. Verse 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach, not to use up authority over the man, but to be in silence. Then he says, Adam was first from the Eve. This means he's talking about marriage. I told you that before. Go get our materials. This is marriage. The word use up authority, interestingly, is not how people use it today. That word use up authority has two words in there. One of them means to carry arms, to bear arms. Authentio is the word. A-U-N-T, A-U, sorry, T-H-E-N-T-E-O. It means to carry arms. It's not referring to Bible teaching. Because that would be very funny. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says the woman should cover her head when she's prophesying in the church. Prophesying includes giving instructions. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, when you come together, everyone ministers the things of the Spirit. That is God's righteousness. So Paul is not referring to a woman not teaching. That's not what he's saying. Hallelujah. God's Spirit is upon all flesh. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? So where you have an aversion to listen to a woman, I tell you, slow of heart and you're a fool. Because God's message is on male and female. His image is male and female. The Salem of God. The Salem of God, which is his agency in the earth. 
is male and female. Hallelujah. And God is faithful. Amen. Faithful. He keeps his Genesis new creation plan alive. Male and female. Amen. So the spirit is upon all. Hallelujah. And I see in the coming days, women, men will break away from barriers. Praise God. And be released into God's purpose and planning the earth. Are you blessed? Stand to your feet. Give God praise. Come on. Thank him. Give him all the praise. Hallelujah.